to surpass is where the Buddha lists six qualities to look for in yourself as you're practicing, to gain a sense of where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, so you can build on your strengths and work on your weaknesses. And one of the qualities is ingenuity. The Pali word bhatipana can mean ingenuity or quick-wittedness, your ability to think on your feet, your ability to think for yourself. And it's a quality that many of us miss in the meditation, especially if you've been doing a type of meditation where the instructions are all laid out, you have to do this, 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 and don't think about it, just do it. That approach to meditation, of course, destroys ingenuity. And it's hard to think about how you could develop discernment without thinking for yourself, without asking questions, without experimenting. That's one way that you can look at the practice as a way of overcoming addictions. In this case, it might not be addiction to a specific drug or intoxicant. All the Buddha does talk about are falling for the intoxication of life and the intoxication of youth and the intoxication of good health. He says we act like drunk people because of these things, forgetting that there are dangers down the line, that the good health is not going to last forever. Your youth is not going to last forever. Your life is not going to last forever. And one of the things I've noticed about people who are addicted is that they lack imagination. They can't think of themselves giving up the addiction. They can't imagine finding happiness without their drug of choice. So that's one of the first things you have to do, is imagine that this is going to work, that you're going to be able to do this practice and attain a pleasure, attain a sense of well-being that's unlike any other. Other forms of well-being, you need to cling, you need to feed. With nirvana, you don't. In fact, it's through letting go of your clinging and emotional feeding and mental feeding that you actually attain true happiness. That right there is something that defies our ordinary way of thinking about life. And it requires that we expand our concept of what's possible and where we would like to devote our energies. At the same time, it's important to realize that as we go through life, we're not just passive recipients of things coming in from outside. We're shaping our experience. So it's important that we learn new ways of shaping things, because after all, this goal that we're going to attain, as the Buddha said, is something we've never reached before, something we've never known before, something we've never realized before. And you're not going to attain it by doing all the things you've done before. There have got to be new things. And so we're asked to look at something that's very ordinary and very present all the time and look at it in a new way, work with it in a new way. That's the breath. It's very close to us. It's the most immediate thing that we experience outside of the mind. If you close your eyes, you realize that the movement of energy in the body is what allows you to know that you've got a body and all your other ways of sensing the body have to come through the breath, this sense of energy that permeates throughout the nervous system. So get in touch with that. It's one of the processes of fabrication by which we shape our experience, and so it's good to think of new ways to shape it. to think of possibilities and then to test them to see if they actually work. This is how you push the envelope. When you breathe in, what is it like to think of breathing in through the back of your neck? 
or some part of the body you've never thought about breathing in before. It can be anywhere in the body. See what that does, how it changes things inside, and whether the change is for good or for bad. This is how you develop your powers of judgment, your ability to detect for yourself what's skillful and what's not. When you have an illness or an injury, use it as an opportunity to learn something new about the breath. It's important that the breath capture your imagination. You've got this range of energy in the body, this field of energy in the body. And it's not just in the body. There's some ways in which there's a cocoon around the body. How do you sense that? Is your cocoon ragged? Is it smooth? Does it have big gaping holes? Or does it provide you with good protection? Those are some questions you can ask. This is how we learn. Ask questions that you may never have asked yourself before. Play around with things. And we read the books from the teachers of the past, not so that we just imitate them down to the last little letter, but they give us an idea of what's possible. Some questions that might be useful, questions that they found useful. And you try to take that and inspire your own ingenuity. Try their approaches for a while and see what works. And if it doesn't quite work, well, what adjustments can you make? There's a study of imagination that said there are basically four steps to imagining something. One is just creating the picture in your mind. And the second is holding the picture in your mind. The third is making changes in the picture, and the fourth is evaluating the changes. This is how you create new things. This is how artists create new works of art. It's how scientists learn new things on the frontiers of knowledge. They've got to picture something in their mind, and then ask, well, what if you change the picture a little bit? First you've got to hold it in mind, and then you make a change, and then you look at it. How about that? And then they try to figure out some way to test it. So it's not just purely imagination. It's imagination in the service of gaining knowledge. So here you are on the frontier of your own knowledge about your mind, about what's possible in the mind. Think about the Buddha. Everybody told him that a deathless happiness was impossible. There's nothing you could do to, to gain that. A happiness that did not depend on feeding, either physical food or mental food, that was said to be impossible. It wasn't even on the range of people's radar that that would be a possibility. Yet he asked these questions, and then he put his life on the line. He basically said, here I am living this way based on this assumption, and it's getting me nowhere. Why am I doing this? Why can't I change? So he tried changing this activity or that approach, and some of his experiments ended up failures. But even from the failures, he learned some important lessons. So even with the failures, the efforts and the ingenuity were not totally lost. This is how he came to realize there are new ways of training the mind that he had never thought of before. And of course they gained results that he had never expected before. We have his example. and gives us some parameters. But a lot of the skill in following his example is to learn where you can play, where you can make adjustments, where you use your own ingenuity. I'm always scared of methods that say, well, everything has been thought out, everything has been worked out, just do what you're told. There's so much of that out there. And how are you supposed to gain any insight at all if you just do what you're told? 
It's like putting your mind into a machine, letting the machine grind it up. At the same time, the Buddha does give you some advice here at play here. It's not totally unsupervised. You're not thrown out onto an empty field and say and told, well, play. You've got the example of others. It's like going out to a playground where they have a good set of playground equipment. And you can play some of the things that other people have done, and you can think up of new games on the playground equipment. You see how other people play, and then you try your own variations. And then you decide to learn a sport. I remember, for me, one of the big revelations when we moved from the little farming community where I was born and grew up, moved into the suburbs and went to a very large school. They had phys ed. We had never had phys ed before. We just had recess. In phys ed, they actually taught you specific games. And so you learn some skills. But even within the, the rules of the games, there was plenty of room for using your ingenuity. So remember, you've got this whole field of your breath energy. You've got John Lee's recommendations on different ways of thinking about the breath. And you notice that even after he wrote his instructions in Method 2, if you look at his Dharma talks, he continued playing with various ways of conceiving the breath. He talked about the breath coming up the spine. In his Method 2, he'd originally talked about the breath going down the spine. But there are times when the breath coming up the spine is going to be useful. The breath coming up from the navel all the way up to the nose, that's another breath that wasn't mentioned in the original instructions. The breath energy spinning around in place, the breath energy that moves back and forth, all kinds of breath energy in the body. And here you are sitting. There may be some pain, there may be some stiffness. What can you do to use the breath in order to alleviate that? There are different qualities of the breath. And John Lee talks about what he says in Thai is called Lom Nio, which is really difficult to translate. Nio means sticky, but also tough. There's a breath energy that doesn't have to move. It fills the body. It feels solid. I think there's a certain sort of strength to your meditation. Think of a tough breath in your back, and it makes it easier to sit on days when you have back pain. When the mind is feeling wired, think of the breath being really, really solid. so I can give you some grounding. Other times when you, you want to think about the fact that most of the atoms in your body are space, or a large part of your atoms are space. Very little actual matter in there. So everything gets opened up and very light. So there's lots to explore here, lots to play with, and it's in the playing that you learn about the process of fabrication. It's precisely the process of fabrication where the Buddha says, you've been shaping your life in an unskillful way, but if you learn how to shape it in a better way, it turns into the path. You get more sophisticated about how you shape things. You get more sensitive. So you finally reach the point where you discover how not to fabricate anything at all. That's difficult. It requires a real leap of the imagination that that could be a possibility, too. But you get there by learning from your experimentations. And you keep experimenting because they're fun. You learn a lot. It's the learning that comes from experimentation and playing around. That's the learning that comes with a real sense of 
accomplishment. And the sense of accomplishment is one of the best ways of finding a sense of well-being. and developing your discernment at the same time. 